Good morning. This is Monday, the 5th of June, and I'm Govindraj Aithiraj with the core report coming to you from Mumbai, India's financial capital. A deadly train disaster in eastern India, the railway's fine line between safety and speed is at stress again. India's big manufacturing incentive meltdown, why and what does it mean? The government once again bans cocktail drugs, 14 this time. Why is this happening? And streaming is going gangbusters. But here's a surprise. Just wait. This is a core report with Govindraj Atiraj. We cannot but mention the tragic rail accident on Friday evening near Kolkata that have at least at last count led to some 275 people losing their lives. The accident involved three different trains, of which one was a stationary goods train. The two trains were the Chennai-bound Coromandel Express and the Kolkata or Howrah-bound Howrah Superfast Express from Bangalore. Now, railway accidents tend to get politicized quickly in India, owing to several reasons. The key one being the railways are government-owned and in turn the track and signaling as well as the rolling stock or the trains that run on those tracks belong to them. And then there is a cabinet-level railway minister to run it all. Railway ministers have been prominent and recent ones have included Mamata Banerjee, Nitish Kumar and Lalu Prasad Yadav. The first two being chief ministers of Bengal and Bihar right now and Yadav of Bihar much earlier. The present railway minister is Ashwini Vaishnav, a bureaucrat and technocrat who's worked in government and in the private sector, including in firms like General Electric. Investigations are on to establish what caused the accident, including, I suppose, if human error or some human role was involved. As that happens, one obviously hopes that while the railways will refocus their energies on maintenance and modernization of track and signaling for safety, they don't lose focus on speed. Remember, both the trains that collided on Friday were running at over 100 kilometers per hour, as they should. B. Rajaram, who succeeded E. Sridharan, the famous metro man at the Konkan Railway Corporation, which manages the 741 kilometer west coast line from Mumbai to Mangalore, once told me in an interview that making trains run fast was a challenge at many levels. It is always easier to go slow because it will be safer, he said. At that point, he wanted trains on the Konkan Railway to do the Mumbai-Goa run in about eight hours. The train could do it, but the railway bureaucracy resisted all through. And eventually, the time was extended. The government is rightly trying to speed up trains, including with the One Day Bharat series. The political capital being extracted from each launch may be a little excessive, But faster trains are welcome and needed, as are more comfortable ones, as speed eventually links to economic growth and more specifically pulling people and freight back from roads which are usually faster nowadays. There are 18 Vande Bharat trains with more lined up and are typically day trains. It is indeed unfortunate that trips between Mumbai and Bangalore can still take almost the same time as they did 40 years ago, which is close to 24 hours. Rajaram actually had an interesting and counterintuitive management insight. He felt that increasing speeds of trains, accounting for safety of course, made everything run more efficiently. People in the railway system are more alert and careful when trains are running faster, he said. And that he felt could actually apply to any organization stepping up the pace, so to speak. Meanwhile, a Vande Bharat train, the 19th, was scheduled to be launched between Mumbai and Goa on Saturday and complete the journey in 7 hours 50 minutes, the kind of time Rajaram was aiming for about 20 years ago. The launch was cancelled, understandably after the big accident in Odisha. Hopefully, it will be on track back soon and safe and fast. Strong medicine again. The government has banned 14 fixed-dose combination or FDC drugs on the grounds that there is no therapeutic justification for these medicines. A notification by the health ministry says that it is necessary to prohibit the manufacture, sale or distribution of these FTC under the Drugs and Cosmetics Act of 1940 in the larger public interest. Interestingly, Bloomberg News reported almost at the same time that the United States inspectors have in recent months uncovered wide-ranging lapses at factories run by some of India's biggest pharmaceutical firms who are exporting to countries like the United States. Dozens of drug makers were apparently issued notices and warning letters by the U.S. Food and Drug Administration, which is increasing visits to Indian factories after the lifting of COVID-19 restrictions last year. The Bloomberg report said inspectors detailed unsanitary conditions in manufacturing plants and poorly trained staff, shredded paperwork and under-investigated customer complaints 
and evidence of exporting contaminated drugs to the United States. Now back to the Indian ban, an FTC is typically a combination of two or more active ingredients, a pharmaceutical term into a single drug formulation. A common one is nimesulide and paracetamol used for pain and fever. Another one, amoxicillin and bromexin used for respiratory tract infections is also banned. And finally, codeine-based formulations used for runny nose, cough and common cold symptoms. From what I could see, only some of these combinations involve drugs made by some of the major companies. For example, Dolomite by Sun Pharmaceuticals, Sumo by Alchem Laboratories and Nimica Plus by Ipka Laboratories in the nimosilide plus paracetamol category. Now, you may have come across brands like Codeine, Oscodine, Rexil B and Moxpro, reflecting some of the other combinations I mentioned earlier. But the value of these is high. Estimates I came across put them at several thousands of crores. The business standard says codeine-based formulations alone constitute roughly a 1,000 crore rupee market. The government has been cracking down on FDCs for some time now. In March 2016, it banned 343 of them. Veteran healthcare industry journalist Vikas Dandekar told me that these cocktails get approvals from state-level authorities, mostly without the need for what is known as bioequivalent studies. So this ban is a band-aid, he says, not a lasting solution. And unless such drugs are approved by a single centralized drug administration, there is no guarantee such products will not come back. Also, many companies may go to court and get stay orders as they did last time. To get a deeper perspective, I'm joined by Murali Nilkantan, a lawyer who has worked as global general counsel with brands like Cipla and Glenmark Laboratories in the past. So this has been... Quite controversial for a very long time, Govind. In 2012 or so, there was a parliamentary standing committee that said, you've got lots of drugs that have been introduced without there actually having been a good reason for their existence. So there haven't been clinical trials. No other country in the world is actually producing these kind of strange combinations. And therefore, they should be banned. The government made some progress with having a list out and saying these are the irrational combinations. There is no justification for having these combinations. Then obviously all the brands went to court. The court said, you should look at it again. The government said, okay, we'll have a committee. The committee came back and said, okay, of this 300 and something, definitely 200 and something are really, really bad. Again, the, there was a challenge to that saying, we've been having these brands for almost 20 or 30 years. Nobody has died. Therefore, the committee is wrong. So this drama has gone on for decades now. And a lot of the well-known combinations that we see, a lot of them don't have any equivalent in any other country. So the question we should be asking, a very common sense question is, if they're so good, why is no other country in the world using them? And if no other country in the world is using them, surely there must be some downside to it. Okay, So those are the two simple common sense questions that people need to ask. Then you have to ask, why is it that they're made in India? If nobody else is making these combinations and selling them, why are these being made in India? Historically, they would add ingredients to get out of price control. Now we got over that loophole. So if any one ingredient is in price control, then the whole combination is in price control. So now it has become a marketing ploy. Rather than taking two medicines, you can take one. Often you realize that you don't need these two medicines in every situation. For example, you may have a cough, but you may not have a fever. You may not have mucus in your throat. You may not have a body ache. You may not have any of those. So actually you can just take one medicine, one for cough. But if you see a lot of these, they will have pain relief, something to help you with congestion, something to help you with body pain, something to help you sleep. All of these things are put into it to try and make it more marketable. And most of these will be sold by the chemist rather than by prescription. So a common man goes to a chemist, says, I have a cough and cold. The chemist will give you something that suits all locations. And for a price that would be cheaper than buying three or four of those separately. So it's become a good marketing gimmick to say buy one, get one free, buy one, get two free. So it keeps going on and on till you get to buy one and get six free. And you may think, what is wrong with this, right? I mean, so the common man may think I'm getting more. The danger with this is that we don't know how these combined together will work. One and two may work, but we don't know how one, two and three will work or one and three will work. So you keep on adding these things to it. We have done no trials to figure out how these work? Do they have long-term effects? Are they necessary? Do they cause other side effects? For example, codeine, does it cause addiction? 
we know some of these things and yet we keep using them that is the issue with it in the case of codeine it appears that there is fear of misuse and manufacturers are saying the opposite saying that you know don't crack down on codeine just because a few people are misusing it from a medical standpoint you can do very well without codeine is codeine necessary in cough syrup and we have enough studies to show that we can manage very well without codeine then you have to ask question if it is not necessary why are we putting it rather than say it is there it has been there and misuse can't be an excuse so we just looking at the question all wrong the problem is you don't need codeine and therefore the problem does not exist rather than say we have used codeine for 30 years or 40 years or 50 years what is the problem with that misuse can't be an excuse the other issue is there is large scale misuse of these products we found you know people having crates of this stuff and it's not a new thing so from both sides it is not necessary and secondly it is being misused there's two reasons therefore to not have codeine in cough syrup right going forward uh, modli you know i can see the marketing allure that you just pointed out you know i mean as a consumer obviously a uh, catch all drug which solves fever sleeplessness uh, cough cold and you get these formulations internationally as well it seems like a very attractive buy particularly over the counter without prescription but going forward how should both consumers and the government and manufacturers look at this i think we'll have to look at it like the western world does which is that each drug has to be looked at separately certain combinations if you want to have them you have to justify them from a medical standpoint and it is better to do them separately so it is not too much effort for cough and cold at least which is what these is is to say if you have to take three of them you can take three little teaspoons of each of them it's not a big deal rather than everybody having to take all three of them all the time so that's the way to put it out and say certain combinations will be allowed which is one or two and then for the others you just buy more of the stuff so you buy one bottle of this and one bottle of that and you should be fine with it uh, it ensures that everybody is not consuming everything all the time uh, there's a large danger with that kind of stuff especially with this kind of drugs which are effectively sold otc even though they should not be so several of them should not be sold otc but they are the reality of india is that they are right and that's something clearly the government is looking out for as well uh, thank you so much for joining us mudli and i'm sure this is a live issue that i'm going to keep coming back to you've heard this before but something is indeed ailing indian manufacturing and once more it's not for the lack of trying let's now look at the outcome of one set of attempts prices of electric two wheelers went up last week june 1st as a lower subsidy structure came into effect prices went up between 10000 to 40000 rupees for scooters that earlier sold at 80000 rupees to 1 lakh rupees obviously a sharp jump the government and its ministry of heavy industries last month restructured the faster adoption and manufacturing of electrical vehicles or fame scheme the new structure has reduced the subsidy per electric two wheeler from 40 to 15% Under the earlier structure some electric two wheelers were getting a subsidy of up to 60000 rupees and now companies would have to absorb or pass on the subsidy loss to customers companies like bajaj auto raised prices by 22000 rupees and ather energy by about 10000 rupees it does appear that some companies are absorbing larger parts of the losses while some are passing it on and making customers bear the difference elsewhere samsung electronics maker of a whole bunch of electronic products including mobile phones and televisions and refrigerators and washing machines may not receive incentives worth 900 crore rupees which it claimed for achieving additional sales worth 15000 crore rupees in the year 2021 the economic times has said now to be eligible for these incentives samsung had to produce handsets or mobile phone handsets with a factory cost exceeding 15000 rupees Apparently some discrepancies were discovered in the company's invoices and the payout was withheld the economic times says the ET report also quotes government officials saying that the discrepancy as it were has been addressed and subsequent invoices were fine but it was unlikely that Samsung would be able to get that 900 crore rupees now manufacturing incentive schemes can be quite complex and vary from industry to industry The mobile handset PLI scheme or the productivity linked incentive scheme started in August 2020 and had an outlay of around 41000 crore rupees over 5 years offering graded incentives or cashbacks worth 6% of incremental sales in the beginning and then dropping thereafter for Samsung 
Apparently, the 6% cashback translated into 900 crore rupees, according to the same reports. Both electric vehicles and phones have one thing in common here, which is that the government has found problems in the way the scheme has been used or misused, as it happened with the two-wheeler companies where they violated localization norms and had to return money, including to their customers. And then we saw the PLI or incentive scheme being prematurely pulled back for the electric two-wheelers. The PLI scheme has always faced some pushback. The arguments for it are fairly obvious. Having it means incentivizing industry to manufacture more, more fast and locally. And in the process, galvanize further India's domestic end-to-end manufacturing ecosystem and create more jobs. The money obviously goes to private hands and that makes some people uncomfortable. Particularly since taxes are low or relatively at least and there are other industrial attractions. More importantly, the fear that incentives could make that part of industry uncompetitive. Now, it is definitely a source of discomfort to everyone if companies are found to have been playing fast and loose with incentives, as the two-wheeler companies clearly did. Now, Samsung specifically may have had some genuine errors, or maybe the government is being too rigid, but all of this leaves a bad taste in the mouth, to put it mildly. Now, the macro view for all of this goes somewhat in this manner. Columnist TN Nainan in the Business Standard, for instance, argued earlier that PLI schemes are worth the investment because they are an infinitesimally small part of overall GDP and worth even the small returns they could generate, which they surely would. On the face of it, that makes sense. Even though some, like former Reserve Bank of India Governor Raghuram Rajan and now a professor of finance at Chicago Booth, disagree. But there is a larger problem that TN Nainan himself pointed out over this weekend. Despite all the Make in India emphasis and the supporting tariff regime, manufacturing is not growing. On the contrary, at 1.3% for 22-23, it is slower for all segments of the economy, including agriculture, which grew at 4%. It is a funny developing economy in which manufacturing is slower than even agriculture, he points out, including in the last four years, which should, as a time period, have balanced out for COVID impact. Amazingly, in the last quarter of last year, that's between Jan and March 2023, agriculture was 25% bigger than manufacturing. This, TN Nainan says, is the exact opposite of what was intended when the government pushed Make in India, including, of course, the physical infrastructure investments. Maybe we are still adjusting to post-COVID shifts, including sustained income inequality, and maybe it will eventually pan out or there is something wrong with the data. But in more ways than one, we seem to be back to the drawing board once again in search of ways and means to improve India's manufacturing prowess. Of course, this is not the end of the story, and I will be back with more soon. Is it streaming or good old television? Some 32 million people watched IPL simultaneously on Reliance-owned Geo Cinema, an app that runs on mobiles as well as television sets. This is a record, as were, of course, the overall IPL numbers, a testament to cricket, its popularity, the format and the viewing of it. Disney Star, the official TV broadcaster, said it got almost 496 million viewers until the finals, with a 44% increase in ratings for IPL playoffs compared to the previous year. Geo Cinema, which is the official digital streaming partner of IPL, said 120 million unique viewers tuned in for the IPL finals alone which if you are also watching, were marred by rains and delays. What does this tell us about the way Indians are consuming entertainment and sports? Is it becoming more mobile-led or does classic broadcast continue to hold sway? And more importantly, what are the trends going forward? To speak on this, I'm joined by Vanita Kohli Khandekar, well-known media analyst and contributing editor with the Business Standard newspaper. When you say 32 million, it's only for the final, by the way, or it was for one particular match. At the aggregate level, so far, we don't have the final figures for May. We have the figures for April. IPL on Geo Cinema has done about 141 million uh, unique visitors. At its peak, it did about 163 million on Disney Hotstar. So I'd like to see the May figures before we sort of pronounce any winners in terms of audience numbers. TV's done exceedingly well from the numbers that were released by Bark and by Disney, 492 million viewers. So it has exceeded the numbers of uh, IPL 22. So everybody's done very well. We're talking about a 600 million plus viewership across TV and digital. 
Uh, as far as revenues is concerned, again, uh, from the analysis that I have available from Media Partners Asia, it looks like digital will do better revenues this time. It should get about 60% of, uh, I think they predicted about 4,500 crore for uh, IPL 23. I'm sorry, but this is the skeptic in me, but nobody will still make money on this because they're spending something like 10,000 crore just on the rights. And I'm not talking operating costs. I'm not talking marketing costs, nothing. So I would hold my horses because the last IPL at the end of all that fuss, uh, five years made just over 2,300 crore. So, okay. So we'll come to the ad dollars, which seems to be significant in its own way. But from a viewership point of view, has either side cannibalized into the other, which is digital into broadcast or the other way around, or have both grown? No, both seem to have grown as far as I'm concerned because remember, all media coexists. TV didn't kill newspapers. TV didn't kill cinema. Everybody's share keeps changing, but they all continue to coexist. Even when you look at the most difficult newspaper markets in the world in developed markets, tell me any major newspaper brands which have died. They haven't. So media tends to coexist. Their shares and their audience sizes and attentions may vary. And you must remember that a large chunk of the biggest, most successful OTTs in India are owned by broadcasters. So how would you then see the trends that you've just described? I mean, you did say that ad dollars are pretty high for streaming and digital. Uh, broadcast, of course, continues to grow. Are you seeing a trajectory there going forward? I mean, as a proportion, maybe, yeah, because digital is growing at 30-40% from whatever I understand, double digits. TV is also growing, but on a larger base. So even if it grows 12-13%, that's a large number. At some point, I think, you know, there'll be some equalization and some taking over because advertising already, if I remember the EY numbers for this year, uh, digital advertising has grown hugely. It's in good shape. There's no doubt about it. But where I think digital loses is on yield for every user that it gets versus what TV gets. There'll be a gap of, I don't know, one is to 10 or one is to seven or something. I honestly haven't seen the index numbers because normally I get these CPMs indexed to various media and I, I have to see them. But that's where I think digital really needs to up its game. Also, this unlimited inventory business is not always healthy for a business, according to me. Unlimited inventory and unlimited content always tends to make advertisers treat a medium more uh, frivolously than they would treat something that has limited inventory and is therefore more premium in their heads. Right. And how are you seeing things go from here? One is you're saying that this was notable, but not significant. And I'm talking about specifically the IPL viewership that we started with. And yet it is part of a continuing trend of increasing digital consumption. So if I were to flip that around, how do you see consumers consuming in the next year or so until at least until the next IPL and beyond? The bulk of the consumption on streaming, and we are talking 510 million uniques. That's the last number I have from Comsco is entertainment. It's a lot of entertainment. And to my mind, the two or three big things is, one is I see more ad-dependent streaming taking off. So not just YouTube. YouTube, of course, is the biggest elephant in the room and they're like 10, 12,000 crore in terms of advertising alone. But I also see a whole lot of other players like MX Player or others. That's something you see globally. There is some exhaustion with subscription or you see a pull down of subscription prices. So that's one thing. I think, a lot of investment should happen more in languages, in sports, though Amazon has done something on the periphery of sports. So what are the three or four big genres which drive viewership? Films, entertainment, sports, as far as entertainment streaming is concerned. So you will see more investment coming. And this is something which has been tracked by various people, not just by me. So you'll see far more action and you'll see far more action, I think, on the sports side in OTT. This will propel more investment, um, a more deeper look at what sports could bring to stream. Last question. So Geo Cinema was the trigger for this conversation because of that high viewership that they saw. But Geo Cinema also in this interim has been acquiring entertainment content. They've acquired HBO, they've acquired NBC, and they've started charging 999 rupees. So how do you see it for them specifically, given that they're a late player, but obviously coming in with a lot of firepower? I mean, the first two, three years, everybody does this. Na? I mean, what happened when the GECs were at war with each other? What happened when the studios came into India in 2008 to 10? They were throwing money and getting as many big projects. And that's exactly what Geo, which is a perfectly fine strategy. To my mind, their problem might be a branding problem. The guy who watches HBO is not going to go to Geo Cinema, to my mind. Succession, I think, was the reason a lot of people were... 
Succession is something more of journalists and editors like. <laughs> it is not. The, I'm sorry to say, it is not exactly the like the most popular thing. You know, if you look at the numbers that some of the shows on Disney Hotstar or on Amazon or even on Netflix do, Succession doesn't do those. HBO at its peak was what three million subs. It's niche, but it gets a very high end subscribers. So there's no doubt that it's a good this thing. But it, I agree, it was a media related uh, show. So you know, media, it, and we all get excited. Yeah. Right. Thank you so much, Vanita. I am going to come back to you for the larger picture as you see it, particularly for the rest of the year. And not just in streaming, but streaming in contrast to broadcast and all other forms of consumption. But for now, thank you so much. That's it for me today. Have a great week ahead and see you tomorrow. This was The Core Report with me, Govind Raj Ethiraj. Do stay connected with more of our coverage at The Core. You can check out our website or sign up to our newsletter at www.thecore.in. That is www.thecore.in. Or follow us on LinkedIn, Twitter and Facebook as well. Now, we would love your feedback on how we can make business more interesting and relevant to you, including our reporting on India's vibrant manufacturing sector. Write to us at feedback at the core.in. Thank you for listening.